controversial talk has been widely advertised throughout the Williamsburg area. And we're very happy and we're very pleased to have with us a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses deliver it. So now we're pleased to introduce Brother Theodore Jarris, who will deliver the talk, False Religion's End is Near. Brother Jarris, please. All of us here have no doubt experienced the end of something. Now, it may be the end of a condition, it may be the end of an event, or it could be the end of a time period. For example, I'm sure all of us have seen an end to a drought or a heat wave, and quite a number of us, if we're a little older in years, have seen the end of a depression or in more recent years, of a recession. Now that has to do with a condition. But now what about an event? How many of us have seen the end of a war, like World War II? You know, it started in 1939, it went on for years, and finally it came to an end in 1945. And recently, when they had a war over in the Middle East, because of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. When uh, that war started, it didn't last too long. It was over in a matter of weeks. Now, last November, or last December, we saw the end of a time period. What was it? We saw the end of the year 1994. But now, when we speak about the end of false religion... Does that surprise you? Well, if you're familiar with the Bible, it shouldn't, because the Bible foretold that this will happen. And even now, we're living in what the Bible calls the final part of the last days. Now, you find this recorded in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And there the Apostle Paul spoke of the last days as a time when there would be troubles and also a lot of people doing things that would be harmful to themselves and to others. So we're living in what we call critical times, hard to deal with. Uh, the Apostle specifically said some people would be lacking in natural affection, they would be fierce, Children would be disobedient to parents, and lo some would love pleasure more than they would love God. And then he also added that some would be hypocritical when it comes to religion. They would profess to be one thing when they were actually something else. In other words, instead of being Christ followers, they were just putting on a front. Well, the Bible shows that this portends or has a meaning of some kind. What is it? It means if we're in the last days, these last days are going to reach a termination point, and we're going to see an end to an entire system as we know it here upon the earth. And the Bible talks about this in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25. Now, as we read these verses, I want you to think about what happens in one nation when there's a problem, like this last week, people got quite excited because they blew off the side of a building in Oklahoma City, and people were living on edge, wondering if it would happen in other cities. Well, that's a tragedy, but when you read these verses that we're going to refer to now, think of what's going to happen in one nation after another. And that's not far off. Now let's read verses 31 to 33 of this 25th chapter. A noise will certainly come clear to the farthest part of the earth, for there is a controversy that Jehovah has with the nations. He must personally put himself in judgment with all flesh. As regards the wicked ones, he must give them to the sword, is the utterance of Jehovah. This is what Jehovah of Armies has said. Look, a calamity is going forth from nation to nation. You notice that? And a great tempest itself will be roused up from the remotest parts of the earth. Now, what is this going to result in? The next verse tells you. 
And those slain by Jehovah will certainly come to be in that day from one end of the earth clear to the other end of the earth. They will not be bewailed, neither will they be gathered up or buried. As manure on the surface of the ground they will become. Now that means there will be so many people who will suffer destruction, there won't be enough people to go around to bury them. They're just going to be like manure on the surface of the ground. Now that's something to try to imagine, and yet it's right here in the Bible. And it shows when that time breaks, it's going to affect all the nations. Now before that happens, and this is important, before that happens, the Bible shows that God's going to separate truth seekers from false religion. In other words, he wants to find people who are not in sympathy with what is being done in false religion and gather them into a place of refuge or safety. So there has to be a difference between classes of people before the end of this system takes place and false religion is destroyed. Now you notice this distinction is described for us in the book of Malachi chapter 3 and verse 18. And you people will again certainly see the distinction between a righteous one and a wicked one, between one serving God and one who has not served him. Now that distinction is going to be so clear it will be evident to people as to who's serving God and doing his will and who isn't, even though they may belong to different churches or religious organizations. Well, now this execution of divine judgment on false religion, it's going to come in a time of what the Bible calls great tribulation. Jesus mentioned this in his prophecy when the question was asked him, what's going to be the sign when all this is going to happen, when the end of this system takes place? And he showed that one of the things that would finally take place after these features of the sign were fulfilled is uh, a great tribulation. Now, in the 24th chapter of Matthew, in verse 21, here's how he put it. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not occurred since the world's beginning until now, nor will occur again. And it's in that tribulation that false religion will suffer a demise. In other words, it will come to its end. Well, now... This matter of false religion, uh, you may be surprised how the Bible describes this whole system of false religion. It uses an illustration to sort of portray what uh, false religion uh, is like. And if you'll turn in the Bible to Revelation chapter 17, we're going to read the first two verses. Now, this is prophetic, of course. And since it's symbolic language or figurative language, we have to understand the key that unlocks the meaning of these symbols. And one of the seven angels that had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment upon the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, whereas those who inhabit the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now here you're looking at a picture. Here is a harlot, a woman who is a prostitute. She's sitting on many waters, and she's committed spiritual fornication. She's had dealings, unclean dealings, with the kings of the earth. Now who is this woman? She's got a name. And if you look down in verse 5, we're going to see what that name is. And upon her forehead was written a name, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots, and the disgusting things of the earth. So that's her name, Babylon the Great. The word Babylon means confusion. And since it's Babylon the Great, that shows how extensive this system is. It represents an empire. It covers the whole earth. So it affects a lot of people, no matter where they live. Now, how do we know it affects people? Well, you notice in that second verse that this woman sits upon many waters. Now, what do those waters represent? Well, you find a key to this in verse 15. 
And he says to me, the waters that you saw where the harlot is sitting mean peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. So this woman dominates people, influences them, but in the wrong way, even misleads them, keeps them in the dark mentally, makes them superstitious, because instead of teaching the Bible, this woman is unclean. That's why she's called a harlot, you see. She's prostituting herself to the services of the kings of the earth. So when we stop to think about how the Bible describes this, then you wonder, what are these kings of the earth going to do to her? Well, you know what happens sometimes when people have uh, immoral relations with others? They finally turn against them. They develop animosity and hatred against them. They just let them satisfy their gratification, and then they chuck them. In, in other words, get rid of them. Now, is this what the political nations are going to do to false religion? Now, let's read verse 16 and see. And the ten horns that you saw, and the wild beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her devastated and naked, and will eat up her fleshy parts, and will completely burn her with fire. Now, this is symbolic language. But these, this beast represents political powers or organizations, nations. Horns represent power. They're going to use their power to gore this harlot, this whirly system of false religion. And here it says they're going to eat her flesh and burn her with fire. They're going to denude her. She's going to be exposed for what she is. And then they're going to get rid of her, desolate her. You know, that's something to think about. You may think it's horrible, but this is the judgment that the Bible says God will express against Babylon the Great. And there's good reason why he's going to do that. Now, after this happens, it may be shocking to some people, but the fact is it's going to come so quickly... It's going to happen as if in one day. In other words, it's going to surprise a lot of people when it takes place, except those who are anticipating that this will happen. If you turn to the 18th chapter of Revelation, we're going to take a look at a couple of verses here that helps us to appreciate what is in store for this woman Babylon. Notice uh, in verse uh, 9, and the kings of the earth who committed fornication with her and lived in shameless luxury will weep and beat themselves in grief over her when they look at the smoke from the burning of her, while they stand at a distance because of their fear of her torment and say, Too bad, too bad, you great city, Babylon, you strong city, because in one hour your judgment has arrived. Now there are some kings of the earth not the radical political elements as a whole who may mourn her, but in addition, who else may, may mourn her? Look at verse 15. The traveling merchants of these things who became rich from her, who stand at a distance because of their fear of her torment, will weep and mourn, saying, Too bad, too bad, the great city clothed with fine linen and purple and scarlet and richly adorned with gold ornaments and precious stone and pearl, because in one hour such great riches have been devastated. You know, when you think of false religion, there's a lot of pretentious edifices. They've got a lot of gold and other precious stones that decorate their buildings. They've accumulated a lot of things at the expense of many poor people. And yet all that's going to go. It's going to be lost. And that's why these merchants mourn, because they were benefiting from Babylon the Great with all of her festivals and her holidays and other things that they carried on that she promoted. Well, now that's no longer going to be available because it's going to dry up. So here we again see what will happen to Babylon the Great. Now in verse 24 of this chapter it says, Yes, in her was found the blood of the prophets, and of the holy ones, and of those who have been slaughtered on the earth. Because of her participation in wars, and supporting those wars, 
and the persecution that she's waged against true Christians. She's blood guilty. She's taken the lives of those who are really serving God, like it says here, the holy ones and prophets, and she's responsible for a lot of wars that have been fought in the name of religion because they've even blessed a lot of these things that have happened. So when we think about what the Bible says, then there's no question that false religion is in for a heavy judgment. Well, we read about those who are going to mourn. What about those that are going to rejoice when this happens? Are there any? Who would they be? Well, turn to the 19th chapter of Revelation. Let's read verses 1 and 2. After these things I heard what was as a loud voice of a great crowd in heaven. They said, Praise Jah, you people. The salvation and the glory and the power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has executed judgment upon the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged the blood of his slaves at her hand. So there are servants of God that are going to rejoice. They'll know that now a day of reckoning has come and justice is going to be balanced because this woman is blood guilty and she's been very hypocritical. She professes to worship God and yet instead she's promoted her own interest, deceived people, and has caused confusion in their minds. So it's no wonder that Jehovah's judgments are going to be expressed in these terms. Well, now, I think we have to appreciate that this is a life and death matter because we're involved as individuals, you see. And the Bible indicates that when Christ, as God's chief executioner, goes into action, he's going to be what the Bible calls him, a king of kings and a lord of lords. And in the 19th chapter of Revelation, he's described as waging war in righteousness. It's not going to be an indiscriminate slaughter, but in righteousness, it's selective. He's going to select those that are deserving of destruction, and he's going to execute Jehovah's judgments upon them. And in the meantime, we have to make sure that we distinguish true religion from the false, because it's the true religion, and those who are practicing it that will be spared, that will survive. It's the practicers of false religion that are going to suffer. And if we read how we can identify such in the book of Matthew chapter 7, maybe it helps us to see where we stand. What's our position in relationship to this big issue that's going to be settled? In the seventh chapter of Matthew, here's what Jesus said, starting with verse 15. Be on the watch for the false prophets that come to you in sheep's covering, but inside there are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you will recognize them. Never do people gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles, do they? And then notice the illustration. Likewise, every good tree produces fine fruit, but every rotten tree produces worthless fruit. A good tree cannot bear worthless fruit, Neither can a rotten tree produce fine fruit. Now here Jesus is illustrating what religions can do. They can either produce good fruit or they can produce rotten fruit. And false religion has been producing rotten fruit. Now what about those who are practicing the true religion? What kind of fruitage do we expect from them? Well, they're going to, there's eight points that we want to cover. And let's see if we can relate to each one of these eight points. Those who practice true religion must first uphold Jehovah's sovereignty. Now, the Bible in Psalm 83, 18 says he's the most high over all the earth. So he's a universal ruler. We have to listen to what he has to say because he rules for our benefit. He's got the verdict on our life. So we have to uphold his sovereignty. He's got the right to say how this earth is going to be governed and how it's going to be administered because this is his property. He created it. So those who practice true worship or religion have to uphold God's sovereignty. Second, 
They have to not only bear God's name worthily, but they must make that name known to others, just as Jesus did. When he was on the earth, he said in prayer, I have made your name manifest to those that you gave me out of the world. He wasn't ashamed of that name. He helped to identify the true God, his purpose, his wonderful qualities. And that's what those who practice the true religion must do. Why? Because when others learn the truth about God, they can, as Romans 10.13 says, call upon the name of Jehovah in order that they might be saved. When the chips are down, who are people going to look to for help? Where are they going to turn in order to be rescued from this great tribulation and from the final end of this system? They can't go to human institutions they can't go to some big-name politician, a governor, a mayor, or a president, because they're going to be helpless. The only one that can do anything for them will be the true God, whose name is Jehovah. If we don't know that name, how can we call upon him? So you see how important it is to know the name, call upon it, and then to bear it worthily. The third point is that those who practice the true religion must preach about the kingdom. And that's a message of good news. When Jesus was on the earth, he taught us to pray, Our Father in the heavens, hallowed be your name, or let your name be sanctified. And then he said, Let your kingdom come. What are we asking for? We're asking for God's government to come and rule over this earth, to come and destroy this wicked system to come and bring blessings to the human family who long for that kingdom to rule so that God's will can be done here as it is in heaven. And today, that good news has to be preached all over the globe. So those who are practicing the true religion would be witnessing concerning the kingdom to all the nations. And then in addition, people would know that when that kingdom does come, as Daniel 2.44 says, it will destroy all human rulerships wipe the earth clean of all unrighteousness, and then we're going to see a clean start, a righteous start for the people that are survivors of the final end. Now as to the fourth point, those who practice the true religion have to preach this word. That's the truth, the Bible. And you know how beneficial it is? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll note what it says. This has to do with the preaching of something that really makes it beneficial. This is uh, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, for disciplining in righteousness, that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. So, if we listen to this word, it will benefit us. We'll know what's right. It'll teach us what's wrong. It'll also instruct us in the way that we should go, set things straight in our life, help us to get sorted out so that we know how to live and how to fulfill our purpose in being here on this planet. So true worshipers would be not only listening to this word, they would be preaching it or spreading it and helping others to understand it. The fifth point, and this is important, how do, I, how do we identify these people? Is there an identifying mark? Now, you don't see a literal mark on them. You don't see them wearing something on their clothes that says, well, I'm a true Christian or I'm a, a true worshiper. They can have that written all over, but it doesn't mean a thing. What counts is what's their conduct like? What kind of qualities do they display? Now, here's what Jesus said we can do to identify these true worshipers. John 13 and verses 34 and 35. I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, and you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if, if you have love among yourselves. So that's the identifying mark, isn't it? These people would love one another. Wouldn't matter what nation they were from, what color skin they had, wouldn't matter whether they rich or poor, what part of the neighborhood they came from, whether they were young or old, they'd all love one another. And that would be an identifying mark. And if they didn't, 
Then what? <laughs> they would be identified as serving somebody else. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. This is uh, in uh, verse 8 and then verses 20 and 21. He that does not love has not come to know God because God is love. And in verses 20 and 21, if anyone makes a statement, I love God, and yet is hating his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot be loving God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should be loving his brother also. So that's the way it is with those who worship God with spirit and truth. The sixth point. These people would have to be neutral when it comes to politics and war because Jesus said he was no part of the world. And we know the world is under the control of the devil. The Bible says the whole world lies under the power of the wicked one. So if we have anything to do with the world, we're its friends. Right? But then we're God's enemies. So if we want to be God's friends, we're not going to be very popular with the world. That's for sure. You know where you find that in the Bible? James chapter 4. And verse 4, Adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world is constituting himself an enemy of God. It can't be any other way, because this world is at odds with those who are really serving God. And we have to be at odds with the world. Otherwise, if we go along with the world, they adopt us. We belong to them. And so whatever happens to the world is going to happen to us. You can't cut it any other way. There's no straddling of the fence because there's no fence to straddle. You're either on one side or you're on the other. Now what's the seventh point? Those who are practicing the true religion have to be in agreement doctrinally. One can't believe one thing and somebody else believes something else. They've got to be united. It's not like some people say, well, what's truth for you is fine, what's truth for me is fine. And they may be at opposite ends of the poles. Well, the Bible says we should speak in agreement and be of the same mind and same line of thought because if you are, then you can work together. If you're not of the same mind and same line of thought, then you work against each other, right? So you can see the wisdom of recognizing the truth and being of the same mind and same line of thought. And then the last point is, and this is some where many will fail. Many will fail. You know what it is? Those who produce good fruitage because they practice true religion must uphold a high moral standards of the Bible. And if they don't, They'll never make it into God's new world. It's as simple as that. If some associate with those who are true worshipers and they begin to practice wrongdoing and are unrepentant, then they are removed from the Christian congregation. That's a judgment of God, actually, because in his word, the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 5, here's what it says, starting in verse 11. Now I am writing you to quit mixing in company with anyone called a brother who is a fornicator or a greedy person or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even eating with such a man. For what do I have to do with judging those outside? Do you not judge those inside while God judges those outside? And then Paul said, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Otherwise you'll all be contaminated. So in God's organization or his congregation, there is a procedure to keep it clean. And in the sixth chapter of Corinthians, and this is interesting, now a person can be out there in the world and he can be a fornicator, he can be a stealer, he can be an extortioner, he can be a drug addict, he can be a drunkard, but he can clean up his life and he can come into God's organization. In 1 Corinthians 6, we read, starting in verse 9, what? Do you not know that unrighteous persons will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be misled, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men kept for unnatural purposes, nor men who lie with men, nor thieves, 
nor greedy persons, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit God's kingdom. So that settles it. Those kind of people will not make it into God's new world. But notice the next verse. And yet that is what some of you were. That's the way some people did live. Maybe they were even associated with the religions, and the religions just tolerated them. They wink at their wrongdoing. But then these people learn the Bible. They learn the truth. They find out what God requires of them, and they clean up their life. And so, as Paul says, but you were washed clean. You know what happens when you go out on a construction job? You get dirty. You get dusty. You go home, and you take a shower, and all the dust and the dirt and the grime is washed away, isn't it? And that's what happens spiritually. You can be dirty out there in the world, but you can get cleaned up, come into God's organization, be presentable to Him and acceptable. Then you can be in a position to survive. God will preserve a person like that into His new world. Now, isn't that interesting how the Bible shows us in a simple way what the fruitage is? That means what kind of life do you live? What do you accomplish? What do you uh, say and do in your life that shows that your fruitage is not the kind that's rotten. It's good. It's fine. And you know we can produce that fruitage even though we're imperfect because with God's help that fruitage is being produced today. Now, let's consider some of the world's bad fruitage represented by its religions, Babylon the Great. We've just finished discussing the good fruitage now let's look at the other side of the picture. What's the bad fruitage? What do you see out there among false religion? Well, let's take some of those eight, same eight points. What about sovereignty? Where is there a religion today that's upholding God's sovereignty? What are the false religions doing? They're getting involved in politics. They're supporting candidates, imperfect men, to get into office to try to clean up the world's mess, and they only make it worse. What about God's name? Many of the false religions don't even want to acknowledge the name of God. They want to re let him remain nameless. They say, well, it's just God, but there are many gods. You can make the almighty dollar your God. That's what one man said when he put on a little invitation. The invitation was to a public talk, and the question that was going to be discussed, who is your God? He put a dollar sign on there. He says, this is my God. Well, it might buy him some things, but is it going to deliver him from death? Can it even buy him perfect health? No. Can it deliver him from trouble? No. It can only go so far, so it's a limited God, isn't it? Even in their estimation. And then when it comes to the kingdom, is the kingdom of God being proclaimed by false religion today? What about the Bible? Do you ever hear the Bible discussed in many of the religions? No, they talk about a social gospel. They talk about how to improve this world system rather than showing what the solution is according to the Bible. And then when it comes to love, instead of unity and love, you find discrimination, you find hatred. You find people fighting one another even though they go to the same church. Uh, we're going to give you a few examples, and we're not the ones that say this. I'm quoting now from what people out there in the world say about themselves and about what they see in their world. In uh, the book Preachers Present Arms, the author said, In the history of civilization, two forces have ever joined together in a dual alliance. They are war and religion. And of all the great world religions, none have, are more devoted to war than is, are those in Christendom. That's in among the religions that profess to be Christian. Christendom is that realm or part of the world that professes to be Christian. The Vancouver Sun in Canada said, It is a weakness of perhaps all organized religion that the church follows the flag. What war was ever fought in which God wasn't claimed to be on both sides? In World War II, people over in Germany prayed that God give them victory. People over in Britain and the United States prayed that God give them victory. And yet they were on the same religion going to the Protestant church or going to the Catholic church. Now, whose side was God on? Neither. Neither. You know, there are a lot of inconsistencies, but this is one of the most prominent, isn't it? When you see that religion fostered this condition, and the poor people followed that blindly. 
Recently in Rwanda, there was a lot of strife. People of the same religion slaughtered each other. Hundreds of thousands were killed. They went to the same church, and later we're going to see what one reporter said, the New York Times. The massacres in Rwanda have caused many Roman Catholics there to feel betrayed by the church hierarchy. The church was often divided along ethnic lines between Hutu and Tutsi. That was in the New York Times. That's not our quote. Then the National Catholic Report, this is a Catholic publication or periodical, said, Rwanda and Burundi are the two most Catholic nations of Africa and the most bloody. What does that say about the religion? Why didn't their religion teach them to love one another instead of hate one another and slaughter one another? Now can we see why God's judgment is against false religion? When it comes to gross immorality among the clergy and the laity, along with homosexuality, pedophilia, dishonesty, and other things, many of the religions are acknowledging that they've got a lot of cleaning up to do if ever they accomplish that. The General Assembly for the Presbyterian Church in the United States admitted, we are facing a crisis terrible in its proportions and implication. Between 10 and 23 percent of the clergy na nationwide have engaged in sexualized behavior or sexual contact with parishioners, clients, employees, and so on. Then they say, live a clean life. But they don't live a clean life. The president of the U.S. Business and Industrial Council confirmed this, saying religious institutions have failed to transmit their historic values and in many cases have become part of the moral problem. Yes, they contribute to it. U.S. News and World Report notes that the Catholic Church has paid hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements to Catholic families because of priests' immorality with their children. And in the paper India Today, it said, Religion has been the banner under which the most hideous crimes have been per perpetrated. It unleashes tremendous violence and is a very destructive force. We aren't saying that. They're saying it about themselves. And the Bible tells us that there would be hypocrites in the last days who would draw near to God with their mouth and honor Him with their lips, but their heart would be far removed from Him. And their worship would be useless, vain, because they teach commands of men as doctrines. So the Bible denounces the hypocrisy of false religion. The Bible says they claim they know God, but they deny him by their works. That's why they're hypocritical. It's like they're wearing a mask, hiding behind it. But God exposes them for what they really are. Now that we've presented what good fruitage is being produced on the one hand and the bad fruitage being produced on the other, the question is which religion, which religion is producing godly fruitage? We have to identify that religion. Otherwise, we wouldn't know where to go. So I'm going to ask the question after this discussion, and you've heard both sides, the good fruitage and the bad fruitage. Who today would you say is upholding God's sovereignty? Who is telling the people that we have to look to Jehovah as the universal ruler to find a solution to the world's problems? Who's making known his name? Who talks about that name? Who bears that name? Who is it, as one book said, has covered the earth with their witnessing concerning the good news of the kingdom? Who is it that takes Bibles to conventions and assemblies and to their congregation meetings and uses it in the neighborhoods, in the community, as a basis to teach the people? Who is it that shows love? today on a global scale, not just in the United States, not just in New York City, but no matter where you go, you'd see the same love manifest among these people. And who is it that's separate from the world's political affairs? Instead of voting men into office, they're neutral. Who is it that avoids getting involved in wars among the nations? Who speaks with one voice, with one accord? No matter who it is that you listen to, they'll all tell you the same thing based on the Bible because they are of the same mind and same line of thought. 
And who is it today that's upholding righteous moral standards? Showing people how to live. Who would you say it is? Can you identify a religion in this neighborhood that's doing all of this? Can you point to a certain religious edifice and say, now the people that go to that church, they're doing all of that. Not just one or two things, not just giving lip service, but doing it in actuality, doing it in deed. You know what the facts show today? There's only one religion, one religion that's doing it today, and that's the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're made up of people that have come from all these different religions. They've left them. And they've come into an organization that's clean. It's welded them together. Brought them together in the bond of love and unity. And uh, it's these people. Now, we don't have to say that ourselves. People out there are saying it. Who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Let me give you an example. A university professor in the Philippines said the witnesses practice religiously what they have learned from the scriptures. He's not a witness. He may be of another faith or he may not even have a belief. But he says, in looking at the facts, the witnesses practice religiously what they have learned from the scriptures. Regarding our refusal to participate in wars and kill our fellow man, one Catholic nun wrote in an Italian church magazine, how different the world would be if we all woke up one morning firmly determined not to take up arms again and slaughter one another on the battlefield of war. Because they know what our position is. They know that we're neutral. They know that we don't go in and participate in the wars of the nations. And regarding our crime-free organization and respect for law and order and our neighbor's property, one columnist in the Montreal, Canada paper said, If Jehovah's Witnesses were the only people in the world, we would not at night have to bolt our doors shut and put on the burglar alarm. How many, how many bolts do you have on your door in your apartment? How many locks are there? Why do we have to have them? Because you can't even trust people in your own building, can you? In the neighborhood. It's because it's a crime-ridden society. But here, this person wrote, if all the people were Jehovah's Witnesses, you could get rid of all those locks and all those bolts, and you wouldn't have to worry about somebody breaking into your house or somebody mugging you on the street or breaking into your automobile to steal the radio or the cassette player or take the car as a whole. Yes, if everybody was Jehovah's Witnesses, you wouldn't have to worry about those things. Wouldn't that be a wonderful way to live? And then regarding their unity, a Mexican newspaper, Verdito, said, concerning Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a praiseworthy unity of faith that seems to distinguish them wherever they are found. No matter where you go, in Mexico or in some other country, Latin America, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, you'll find that Jehovah's Witnesses have a unity of faith. That's why you can bring people from all these nations together and they all get along like one family. That's been demonstrated time and time again. Regarding their, mor uh, their morality, a South African man wrote, I think very highly of Witnesses' morals and behavior. You are the only variety of Christianity I've come across whose members consistently practice, practice what they profess. That's beautiful. To practice what you profess. Practice what you preach. Don't say one thing and do another, as the hypocritical religions of false religion are doing. And one Catholic priest said, I can no longer distinguish the believer in the world's religions from the pagan. I can distinguish the Jehovah's Witness, but not the followers of the traditional faiths. That's what a Catholic priest said. He can t tell a Jehovah's Witness because it's the way we live, it's the way we act, it's the preaching that we do. It's the fruitage of the Spirit that we produce. So, that's why the Bible says in Isaiah 43.10, You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. And so as we serve as God's witnesses, we can speak the truth 
and then leave it up to the people as to whether they want to accept it or not. Now, after this discussion, I think we can all appreciate why it is that Jesus foretold that false religion would be destroyed. In Matthew chapter 7, he showed that just like a tree that bears rotten fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so the same thing, same thing is going to happen to false religion. Every tree not producing fine fruit gets cut down and thrown into the fire. Really then, by their fruits, you will recognize those people. So, can we recognize false religion by its fruitage? Can we also recognize true religion by its fine fruitage? Then, if we can, then we have to take a stand. Like the people did back in Elijah's time when the Baal priests were assembled with the servants of Jehovah, they said, well, now, who is the true God? And then they told the Baal priest, now, you pray to your God, and if he consumes his sacrifice, then that's the God that we'll worship. But if he doesn't, then... We'll see what happens when Elijah prays to his God. So the Baal priest prayed all day and nothing happened. But as soon as Elijah prayed, fire came down from heaven and licked up the sacrifice, even licked up the water that was in the trench surrounding it. And all the people says, Jehovah is the true God. They had a demonstration of his power today. We see the demonstration of God's power and what is being accomplished through his people. But we're going to see a greater demonstration of his power in the near future. But we have to take a stand on the right side before that judgment is executed. Because in Revelation 18:4 it says, Come out of her, that's out of Babylon the great, come out of these false religions, my people, if you do not want to receive part of her plagues. So before it destruction of religion, false religion takes place, we have to separate from that false religion and take a firm stand on the side of truth and righteousness because this is the hour for Jehovah's judgment. Then we can be in line to be preserved when that uh, final end comes and then to be able to see the day as Psalm 37 and also verse 10 tells us, no more and you will certainly give attention to his place and he will not be but the meek ones themselves will possess the earth and they will indeed find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. So now, in view of all the good that will result from the end of false religion, what do we conclude? Well, how should we feel about this matter? Well, I think that every one of us here can agree that in view of what the Bible teaches, that God will put an end to false religion soon, that we can rejoice. Yes, we can rejoice that that time is close. So, let it be known. Let it be known. There's no question that all of us here are deeply impressed. The volume of work that was done in connection with this project was phenomenal. And I think we're all happy that the Assembly Hall Committee has survived. Very intact. And as evidenced by the parts that they presented on the program, why they're more enthusiastic than ever before, which reminds me of what the wise man Solomon said, better is the end of the matter than the beginning. So we're all happy that Jehovah's Blessing has been upon this project. It really takes an occasion like this to Perhaps uh, be reminded of what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 127 and verse 1. Unless Jehovah himself builds the house, it is to no avail that its builders should work hard. So we have Jehovah's heavenly support and his blessing. And I'm sure as all of us uh, walked around the facility either today or previously, uh, we can see reflected in the workmanship here a real devotion to Jehovah and so many of the qualities that characterize God's people. And I think we can say in looking at this facility overall that it's very attractive, functional, the brothers are conscious in the use of their of the resources, and most of all it's a credit to Jehovah's theocratic organization and a praise to our Heavenly Father's great name.
Well, Brother Owens, he acknowledges the fact that we have a lot of Spanish-speaking publishers here with us in the audience. So in my uh, limited Spanish, I would like to just add, uh, for their benefit, the following. Es un placer para mi esposa y para mi estar aquí para este programa de dedicación. El hermano Steven mencionó justo antes de nuestro último cántico cuando ofició el Comité de Salón de Asambleas La Ollada que, que se decidió para este proyecto de parte de todos los circuitos de habla hispana. Quiero darles una bienvenida a tantos de ustedes aquí presentes para este programa. Probably you're aware that there's a lot of talk out there in the world nowadays about building and preparing for the 21st century. How many people realize, however, what it means to build and prepare for the millennial reign of a messianic kingdom. We know that this will include all but a small fraction of the seventh millennium of human existence. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, over five and a half million active in the ministry and millions of their associates, well, they are realistically looking beyond the dawn of what may develop in the 21st century. There's something very significant that's happening all around the globe at the present time. And we can say in the word it's building for the future. Now while material buildings have their place, we also want to look at it from the Bible standpoint. And we can appreciate that a lot of theocratic activity at the present time is mind-boggling because it's hard to comprehend everything that's happening on the face of the globe. But from Jehovah's viewpoint, he takes it all in. And when we think of building, we cannot discount what is happening in the world. But a lot of that is in vain because of the limited future that is in store for this system. A building is very much like buying and selling. It's an everyday affair or activity. It's interesting, however, to note that in his commentary on the sign of his presence and the conclusion of the system of things, Jesus referred to this feature of human activity in the book of Luke, chapter 17 and verses 26 through 30. Now let's notice the parallel that he draws. Moreover, just as it occurred in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, men were marrying, women were being given in marriage, until that day when Noah entered into the ark, and the flood arrived and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it occurred in the days of Lot, they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. Now this parallel is significant because in a few words here, Jesus summed up what preoccupies many people today. And if you look on the world scene and the population, the region, there's great demand for building things either to fill the needs of the people or to care for the wants. There are more individual dwellings and apartments that are going up. You see that in the part of the California. Structures of all kinds to serve the needs of government and business are uh, appearing. In fact, right in this area, if you look around, there are a lot of industrial complexes and business houses. New roads are being built. And here in Southern California, I remember Compared to the time when I was here in district work about 37 years ago when we started, you have a lot of new freeways. Back then it was the San Bernardino Freeway and the Harbor Freeway and the Santa Ana Freeway. 
How many more have you got now? And you have a new transportation system. At least we saw it as we traveled from the airport. It's uh, the train that runs off to Norwalk. And uh, we see the same thing taking place in a lot of other cities. That's the means of communication. For example, uh, we not only have faxes, but we have CompuServe, and we have computerization with the internet. But there's something else that's happening. This immigration has set in. What man has built up is breaking down. In many places, roadways and bridges and tunnels and sewage and telephone systems and housing projects and other construction, it has to be urgently renewed or replaced. But the problem then is governments are running out of money. And so you see many structures standing unfinished. You have entire highways where it's never been completed. You go into some other country and you find big apartments, only the shell is there because they run out of money. Many companies have tried to invest in other countries and they perhaps want to put up a big hotel or a motel or perhaps even cathedrals. And they've been standing for years unfinished because they've run out of money. Well, this casts a deep shadow across the future and Many nations are now viewing what is ahead with a great deal of uncertainty. As the proverb says, they don't know what a new day will give birth to. But now what about God's people? We're carrying on a tremendous building program, are we not? And we have to acknowledge that uh, this is not only on the local level, it's all over this country, and you find it in many, many other lands. In fact, just in the last six months, we've had new branches either enlarged or completed and dedicated in Argentina, in Brazil, the Dominican Republic, in Greek Guiana. This weekend, they're dedicating a new branch in Jamaica along with an assembly hall, and we've had new assembly halls dedicated in Mexico as well as here in the United States. And then outside of this hemisphere, we've had new branches and assembly halls going up in Australia, Lebanon, in uh, Madagascar, Sierra Leone had their dedication just last month, and also down in South Africa, to mention a few, and others are online. Well, when the plans for this facility were first conceived, and then later developed, I think we can say that the brothers who are responsible were looking to the future. But not the future that the world anticipates. Because we not only build, we also eat and drink, we buy and sell, we get married, we find it necessary to do a lot of other things, just as they did back in the days of Noah and as they did in the days of Lot. But there's a big difference. And what is that? Well, people in this system carry on all of these ordinary affairs of life without regard to what is in store in the immediate future. And they're not sure about the prospects that lie ahead. So it's just as it was in the days of Noah. Now while he was building, for the future, and he demonstrated godly fear as well as a great deal of faith. The people on the outside were carrying on seeking their own pleasure, and uh, they turned a deaf ear to Noah's warning, even though he was a preacher of righteousness. As the scripture says, they took no note until it was too late, because by then the door to the ark was shut. Well, today, people are also deeply engrossed with their individual and collective programs and other interests in life. And they're not really building with a lasting view to the future or with God's kingdom in view. Their motive is, let's enjoy ourselves for as long as we're here, or as long as this world may last, whatever time may be left. And as in Noah's day and in Lost Time, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 20 holds true. 
There will prove to be no future for anyone then. The very land of wicked people will be extinguished. And then to add, Psalm 37, verse 38 says, the future of wicked people will be cut off. Now that reminds us of what Jesus said when he spoke about the parable of the sheep and the goats and then the rendering of judgment finally. He showed that those goats would go into everlasting cutting off. That comes very abruptly. And as Jesus said, that day will come as a snare. Even when it comes to building what individuals may plan, it's vital to maintain a good relationship with Jehovah. That is, those who are within the theocratic organization must keep in mind that there's a time element to consider. Now, that time element may not only be viewed chronologically, but it has to be viewed as to who has the verdict on our life. And you may remember the illustration that Jesus gave as recorded in Luke chapter 12. It's a very powerful lesson that he taught about the man who wanted to pull down his arms and build bigger ones. Do you remember what his motive was? Well, let's turn to the account, Luke 12, starting with verse 15. Keep your eyes open and guard against every sort of covetousness, because even when a person has an abundance, his life does not result from the things he possesses. With that, he spoke an illustration to that saying. The land of a certain rich man produced well. Consequently, he began reasoning with it himself, saying, What shall I do, now that I have nowhere to gather my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will tear down my storehouses and build bigger ones, and there I will gather all my grain and all my good things. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many good things laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, Unreasonable one, this night they are demanding your soul from you. Who then is to have the things you stored up? Jesus made the application. So it goes with the man that lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now as you reflect on that, that illustration, who do you think this man was thinking about? Was he thinking of serving in God's interests? Was he concerned about his neighbors who may have been going hungry? And so he wanted to store up more grain? distribute to the poor. No, his motive is shown up very clearly in what the Bible says here in verse 19. Soliloquizing or talking to himself, he says, So you have many good things laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, enjoy yourself. He was only thinking about himself, wasn't he? And what he was going to use his resources for. So, when we carry on our personal plans, whether we're eating or drinking, or doing anything else, Paul says, let us do all things for God's glory. Then our efforts are not going to be wasted. We'll not act rashly. We're not going to be unreasonable. We're going to act with soundness of mind and righteousness amid the present system of things. Although we have to care for life's necessities day by day, we do take into account what the Bible says about the future. And the Apostle Peter stresses the need to keep close in mind the day of Jehovah and how he's working out his will and his purpose. We've had recent articles that have stressed this point, the March 1st issue, for example, to find study articles. And it really takes a little bit of reflection and self-examination to see how does that apply to us individually. And if we think about Noah, when he was back there amid that world of violence and all flesh ruining its way on the earth, he never lost sight of his assignment. God had commissioned him to build that ark and to keep himself separate from the world and to condemn it, knowing that its days were numbered. So when we stop to think about the future and building for it, 
we have to do it in line with the principles that the Bible sets out. At Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18, the wise man says, Let your heart not be envious of sinners, but be in fear of Jehovah all day long, for in that case there will exist a future, and your own hope will not be cut off. So we have the assurance in the Bible that if we act wisely and we build for the future in accord with Jehovah's will, then what we build is going to last. And we have another example which uh, we studied about recently in the Watchtower, and it has to do with uh, one of the wisest men of ancient times. This is Solomon, and we recall what he did according to the second chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. He sort of relates some of his own experiences, and they were in there because they wanted to be separate from the world. And I said, now after I read these verses, I'm going to ask you a question. So the verses here in that we might have to read as follows. Solomon said, I engage in greater works. I build houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I make gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them fruit trees of all sorts. I make pools of water for myself to irrigate within the forest, springing up with trees. So I put the question to these young brothers. Now, what was Solomon doing here? What was the problem? And a number made an effort to answer the question, but they didn't really get it on target. And then the commander of this prison, who was a worthy person and happened to be sitting and listening, he says, well, I, I, I would like to comment. He says he was thinking of himself. He got the point, didn't he? He got the point, even though he was a worldly man. And that's true, isn't it? All of those personal programs of Solomon didn't get him very far because later on in this same chapter, he shows that everything that he was pursuing was like chasing after the wind. It was a lot of vanity. And you know what happens if you try to get a hold of the wind? It's very elusive. You never get a grip on it. You never catch up with it. So that's the way it is with many people today, isn't it? They're chasing after the wind. Something elusive. Something that is not concrete or substantial. It's unrealistic. And for this reason, when Solomon came to the essence of his entire book, in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, he could say with conviction, the conclusion of the matter, everything having been heard, is fear the true God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole obligation of man. But the true God himself will bring every sort of work into the judgment in relation to every hidden thing as to whether it is good or bad. So there's a standard by which Jehovah will judge whether something is going to last or whether it will terminate. Then we have the greater than Solomon, Jesus Christ, when he was here upon the earth. He, of course, taught in such a way that it was astounding for people, and particularly when they got the point. Now, you take the Sermon on the Mount, for example. In the fifth through the seventh chapters of the book of Matthew, Jesus related many things, and it's a study in itself. But when he came to the conclusion of that sermon, as recorded in the 24th through the 27th verses, he made a very powerful application of all that he said. And this is how he summed it up. Therefore, everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them will be likened to a discreet man who built his house upon the rock mass. And the rain poured down, and the floods came, and the winds blew and lashed against that house, but it did not cave in, for it had been founded upon the rock mass. Furthermore, everyone hearing these sayings of mine and not doing them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain poured down, and the floods came, and the winds blew and struck against that house, and it caved in, and its collapse was great. Well, we know what Jesus was talking about here. And it helps us to realize how important it is for us to constantly heed the scriptures and build on the solid foundation, the rock mass as it were, so that when tests and trials come our way, we will not go to pieces. But that's what happens with a lot of people in the world. They have nothing that can hold them together, nothing to which they can anchor, because they are not applying 
the sayings of the Virgin and Solomon Jesus Christ. And there's no future for them. And Jesus warned that when the Great Tribulation comes, it's only those who have the right qualities, the fire-resistant qualities built into them, and who have been applying Bible principles in their life consistently, that will be able to stand before the Son of Man and have the prospect of surviving in the Jehovah's Righteous New World. Now, as you know, at the present time, we have millions of people that are associated with Jehovah's Organization. Somewhere along the line, these millions that have come to the memorial are going to have to make a decision. And it may be that as time passes, they will be forced to realize that they cannot straddle the fence. They will have to decide whether they're on the side of the truth or whether they're against Christ Jesus and what he represents. Now, this year, for example, we had a tremendous attendance at the memorial in some countries despite trials. Even in this country, we had reports of fine attendances in the New York City area we had 6% more this year than we did last year. In the country of Albania, where they had all that internal strife during the month of March, and they had a curfew in effect on the weekend of the memorial, the brothers could not use their kingdom hall. They could not use schools. They had to use private homes, congregation book study locations. And despite those circumstances, they had to be in at 7 p.m., so they had to start the memorial by 5.45 so as to start serving the emblems after sundown and then have at least 20 minutes to get home. In view of all those circumstances, they had five times as many people in attendance at the memorial as they had publishers in the country. It's remarkable. We had a brother that came from the Ukraine in April and he came for a visit. And uh, I remember we had the opportunity, Brother Hitchell and I, to give public talks in the congregation where he serves. And they used the engage the schoolhouse because they didn't have Kingdom Halls in the city of Kiev at the time. And uh, on both occasions, they had about 325 to 340 people in attendance, even though they had only about 110 or 120 publishers. So I asked him, uh, well, how many did you have at the memorial this year? He said we had 687. And how many publishers do you have? 130. And in addition to that, he's the only elder. How would you like to be in his shoes? He has a big load of responsibility on his shoulders. But you see, Jehovah's Spirit makes up for a lot of lack. And even though he was the only appointed elder, Jehovah's Spirit flowed. Nevertheless, and there, he had a lot of assistance and ministerial service. And just before he left to come to the United States, he got a letter from the office in the beef, and they appointed another elder. So we come, well, Jehovah will always raise up additional help when you need it. <laughs> so he was able to have a brother to act as his um, substitute and care for things while he was away. We also heard from a number of other countries that had tremendous attendances at the memorial. But the point is that when you think about 13 million people or so that come to the memorial, we have five and a half million active witnesses. What would happen if all those people coming to the memorial were to take their stand for the truth in a few years? Where would we put them? Kingdom halls, assembly halls, we need them. The space is necessary. We hope can look down the stream of time and see what is in store. And so we are building for the future to accommodate as many of the great crowd as Jehovah is pleased to bring in so that they can be taught by him and form the nucleus of that new world society that will survive into the new system of things. When we think about uh, how quickly some are coming into the truth now, that's another aspect to think about. People go to the knowledge book and they don't even wait until they finish it. They say, I want to be baptized. But the elders urge them to complete the book. And then they have these question sessions with them based on the our ministry textbook. And then they are able to be acceptable for water baptism, the symbol of their dedication. I don't know how many accounts we have had sent into the society. 
telling about people who had come into the truth before they ever finished the book. That is, they're convinced it's the truth, they, they're active in the ministry, they want to do something about it. So it shows that we're not just conducting studies for the sake of putting in time. True, our number of home Bible studies have gone down in this country, but there's been a culling out of a lot of individuals who've been studying for years, but have never been taking any positive steps to become actively associated with the organization. So as we continue these Bible studies, it will be interesting to see what happens. In one country in Africa, for example, even though their placements are not very high, they're nowhere near what we have in this country, yet they have more than twice as many home Bible studies as they have publishers in the country. If we had the same ratio in the United States, we would have over two million home Bible studies in the United States. Yet the books are placed, because last service year, 32 million copies of the knowledge book were left with people along with other books and that was 32 percent more than we placed the year before so the books are in the hands of the people the question is to help these individuals see the importance and the urgency of taking time to study god's word so as to act upon the warning that it gives and we certainly want to help these new ones that are coming in to be firmly rooted and established in the truth. And that's why our building involves not just putting up kingdom halls and assembly halls, but once we put up these structures to bring people to the kingdom hall and to the assembly hall where they can be taught by Jehovah. They can benefit from this ongoing program of divine education. And the Apostle Paul alerted us to this aspect of our building in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 10 of uh, that portion of his letter, he says, According to the undeserved kindness of God that was given to me as a wise director of works, I laid a foundation, but someone else is building on it. But let each one keep watching how he is building on it. Now he's not talking about a physical structure here. And the reason we know that is because of what he says in verse 11. For no man can lay any other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if we're building on him, the real rock mass, as it were, and then we build with the right kind of materials, we can help stabilize the many new ones that are coming into the organization so that they will not be quickly shaken and either fall away or drift away from the organization. So what kind of materials do we build with? Well, Paul mentions that in the next verse. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood materials, hay, stubble, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will show it up, because it will be revealed by means of fire, and the fire itself will prove what sort of work each one's is. So if we build with combustible materials, then there's not going to be anything that will... Uh, we'll have to show for our effort. But if we build with fire-resistant materials, and we build these qualities into people, then it's like building with precious stones or metal, isn't it? It's going to last. So we had articles in the Watchtower recently talking about the need for holiness, for example. And it raised the question, are you making improvement in your personal holiness? And when you think of people coming out of the world, look at the things that they have to get rid of. They have to clean up their life. Some of them have made a mess of their life, but they were willing to do it. And some of them, one step after another, they get rid of this, that, and the other, so that they can be welcomed into the organization. And Jehovah God is making provision for that. We had articles on loyalty. Loyalty to the Bible. Loyalty to the organization. Why? Because if we do not develop this quality, if we do not help our Bible students to have it, well, then their loyalty is going to be tested, and then what will they do? They can't serve two masters. It's either going to be one or the other. We've had a beautiful article in the Watchtower recently dealing with the need to be clean. And it's not just physically, but mentally, morally, as well as spiritually. We have to have godly devotion and live by this quality. And if we're devoted to Bible principles and we respect what is in the Bible, and know that there's no substitute for the counselors here, then we have guidance. We have a standard to go by. We're not unsure of ourselves. 
So these are qualities that we want to build into Bible students, new ones that are coming into the organization. Now, the other day, one of the brothers was telling me about a circuit that met here. They had about 20 800 publishers, but they had 3,700 in attendance for their circuit assembly. So it's evident they had about 900 people who are new, Bible students. Well, when they attend a circuit assembly, what a wonderful program they take in. And many of these new ones often comment on points that they have learned perhaps for the first time, and they see the organization in operation, and they say, well, this is the organization I want to be a part of. I want to get absorbed. I want to get involved. So it's good to bring them to the congregation meetings and to the assembly halls. But we have to also regularly attend these meetings. And we'll comment on that perhaps a little bit more later. So we can appreciate why we're building for the future to take care of the in-gap. To also prepare people for survival when the Great Tribulation comes. And the future that lies beyond the end of this system, not just into the 21st century, but the future that lies ahead in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. We have to have a long range view of matters and not just short term. So when we build, we build with faith in Jehovah and he rewards us. And how good it was to be able to realize that here you didn't run out of money. You heeded what the illustration teaches us in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. For example, who of you who wants to build a tower does not first sit down and calculate the expense to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he might lay his foundation but not be able to finish it. And all the onlookers might start to ridicule him, saying, This man started to build but was not able to finish. But we were able to finish. And it's commendable that you brothers supported it with your resources. As Proverbs chapter 3 says, you honored Jehovah with your valuable things, and he has prospered the arrangement. And the brothers, of course, were conscious of how they use the resources so that whatever is left, even if they come under budget, can be used to good advantage in the future in advancing the kingdom work. So we're very thankful that Jehovah has backed us up. And we always want to be mindful of that. That he's with us he's not against us if we always appeal to him in prayer and do it in faith he will be with us and support us especially when we have trials and difficulties and tests and it's very appropriate that when we think of all that went into this structure this project that it reflects a lot of effort time skills and resources but also it can be summed up as in that we wanted to express our love for Jehovah and we wanted to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. If we had not been following that principle, this building would not be here. So it's Jehovah that directed our steps. And it's to Jehovah that this building belongs. It's, entrust, it's entrusted to us and we have to answer for this trust but we're very happy to care for it. And we notice how diligently the brothers were working to make sure that everything was done according to the society's standards. Well, we've come to the point where we want to now join in united prayer in uh, giving this building to Jehovah. As the circuit assemblies and district conventions and candidates stand up and indicate that they are ready to be baptized and symbol of their dedication, we have a prayer at that time. And to represent the traveling overseers in uh, this particular area, we're going to call on Brother Valores, and he'll represent all of us now in prayer as we uh, address ourselves to our Heavenly Father. Our loving Father Jehovah, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus, your Son. We are pleased to be here together to share in the dedication program of this, this building. It has uh, become necessary to build many such structures throughout the world to help people in their understanding of you and give great praise to your name. And it is a result of people responding to the good news that you have us preach. We have sanctified you in our lives. You occupy the position of sovereign. You are a great king. 
our eternal Father. And we're most pleased to tell other people about you and help them sanctify you in their lives. So many people have responded that we need assembly halls such as this. And all the thousands of people who have spent so much time here, we're pleased to offer this to you in dedication. We appreciate, Father, that all of the resources that went into this, all the material resources and all the energies, they really do not come from us, they come from you. You have given us everything on this earth, and you've given us the abilities that we have. And by means of your Holy Spirit, uh, this building has been produced. Uh, it's going to be used solely for your worship and for no other purpose. So in effect, we have given to you what you have given or entrusted to us. We're pleased then, Jehovah God, to dedicate this building for your purpose and toward your use and worship. And we ask you, please, hear and accept our prayer as we offer it in the name of Jesus, your Son. Well, it's a pleasure to know that now this Assembly Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses in Miracle, California has been officially and scripturally dedicated to Jehovah. Well, our time has gone by very rapidly, and uh, I thought maybe I'd just share a thought or two with you about what's been happening in a few other places where facilities have been dedicated, but I'm going to give you a condensed version because uh, some of you have some other appointments, I'm sure. But in the last six months, we've had dedication programs in a number of lands. I have the privilege of being in the Dominican Republic last November. And there we have not only a new branch, but also an assembly hall that seats 3,000 that was dedicated at the same time. And they have a kingdom hall on the premises. And while there, uh, it was interesting to see a circuit assembly the week after the dedication, and sure enough, they had 3,000 in attendance. So the brothers, uh, they did their calculations right. We also had a special meeting in that country where they have about 20,000 publishers. We had a stadium in San Domingo in the south and one in Santiago in the north. There were 35,000 present at these two special meetings. So when you stop to think of 20,000 publishers in the country, 35,000 in attendance at that meeting. It shows what a potential exists for future growth and increase. And they had over 10,000 more in attendance at the memorial. They had about 69,000 present. So it shows in some of these lands that a lot of this sowing that we've been doing, a lot of this effort that we put out to contact people and talk to them is producing some fruitage and people are responding, they're beginning to realize what Zechariah 8.23 says, that uh, ten men would take hold of the spirit of him that is a Jew and say, where can we go with you? For we have heard that God is with you people. They see the evidence that Jehovah is with his servants. They see the fruitage of the spirit operating upon dedicated people. And they know that we have the interest of others at heart. We're expressing our love and trying to assist these people to come to understand the Bible, know something about Jehovah and his purpose. And while I was there in San Domingo, I was very much impressed with the effort that the brothers are putting forth. There was one brother who had been working on the project, and now he's serving there with the need is great, and sort of offhandedly he said, you know, my wife is very busy here. She loves this territory. She has 19 home Bible studies. And that's typical of what many of the missionaries and pioneers are doing. In fact, there was a member of the Bethel family there. When I heard what this sister was doing, I wondered, how can she arrange this with the Bethel schedule, where you work five and a half days a week, you have a Monday night meeting, you go to the book study on Tuesday, you have a Thursday night midweek meeting, you go to the weekend meetings at the Kingdom Hall, and she was conducting 14 home Bible studies besides that. But she works in the kitchen, so she gets up at 4.30 in the morning, she gets off at 1.30, so she has a little siesta, and then she goes out in the field service for the balance of the afternoon and then the weekend. That's real devotion. Then we also had the, the opportunity to talk to many of the missionaries, and they were telling us about so many of their experiences. And that's just a little island over there in the Caribbean, not far from the mainland United States. 
But when you think of these places, you can see how there is some good fishing in the corn fields. The harvest is right. The workers are few. So they have hundreds of brothers who come over there to serve where the need is greater. Then uh, we also had uh, our dear brother Barber. He's 90 years old now. He went to take care of a dedication in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, during the month of March. And they had uh, a tremendous attendance. They overflowed the River Stadium. It's got a capacity of 55,000. They had about 10,000 more than that. And that was just for the greater Buenos Aires area. Back 30 years ago, they only had 7,000 publishers in that country. So you can see now they're well over 100,000. And the potential for growth is enormous. Then Brother Henschel went to Brazil. We have enlarged our facilities there. It's like a little city. It's two miles, or rather two hours drive west of the city of Sao Paulo. And uh, they have uh, a big printing factory there. They have over 400,000 publishers now, over a million that have attended the memorial. And the work is booming. In the Amazon area, they have sent temporary special pioneers to work in those jungle regions and they find tremendous amount of interest and new congregations are springing up all over the Amazon basin. But we have brothers who are willing to go to the serve where the need is great amid primitive surroundings. They use all of their resources and the society of course is giving them full support. So we're glad to see how the work is forging ahead in Brazil. Brother Barry, he went down to Australia in the month of February. They have had to put up new residence buildings and enlarge their factory. Uh, they have over 60,000 publishers now in Australia, and the work is moving forward very well. They do a lot to support the work also in other islands of the South Pacific. Brother Sidlick, he's in Jamaica this weekend. As we mentioned, they have a dedication of their new branch facilities, and there's a new assembly hall also that will be used in conjunction with the work. They have well over 10,000 publishers on that small island. So it's interesting to see how these settlements of pure worship are multiplying everywhere you turn. And then next month, we're going to have a dedication of a new office building in Tallinn, and also two kingdom halls that are in the main complex, plus another kingdom hall in the city of Tallinn that will make three kingdom halls. All of this will be dedicated the weekend of June 15 and 16. And then the following week, the dedication of the new branch facilities in Solnitsnoya, Russia. Uh, that is going to be a big event because the work is really mushrooming in that country. So we're looking forward to being with our brothers in uh, that part of the field. And there are going to be many visitors that will be going to Russia to take that event in. We also see the work moving ahead very nicely in the city of uh, Kiev. They have 35 congregations now. I remember when there was only one seven years ago. And now the work is moving ahead to the point where they have over 60,000 publishers in the Ukraine. And last summer at their district conventions, when we in this country are happy to see 1% of the peak attendance uh, represented by candidates for baptism, or in some places 2% or 3%, they had 9%, 10%, 11%, in one case, 12% baptized. So it shows that that international convention that we had back there in 1993 in Kiev was really a tremendous impetus to the work. And uh, that incidentally set a new record for the number of baptisms at any convention that we've ever had in our modern day history. Surpassed the number that were baptized. But those, those that belong to him, and in all of these countries, his spirit is moving uh, his people to do as much as they can to gather in the increase while there is still time. At Brooklyn Bethel and Patterson and also Walk Hill, uh, we're endeavoring to simplify things and coordinate matters so as to make better use of our resources as well as the personnel. We have about 5,500 now in the family, which is a big family. And we also have a lot of people represented in the family from all parts of this country and from a number of foreign fields. So the temporary workers have come to help us out on the project at the Towers and also at Walk Hill. And some of the finishing work that we have to do in Patterson is very much appreciated. So despite uh, all the demand that is made for skilled workers, somehow Jehovah sees that they're spread around 
equally, and uh, the need is met. So we're very grateful for his direction and for the fine cooperation and support of all the brothers. Well, when we stop to think about all this building work, we know even people of the world are oftentimes impressed, as some of the committee members indicated here. Recently, we had a report that came in from the field, and the newspaper journalist who interviewed the brothers and had observed the quick bill during the three-day period. He said the Jehovah's Witnesses are best known for their door to door ministry, for their stand when it comes to the five salute, for the fact that they're neutral, they do not participate in wars waged by the nations of the world. But he said, now we might consider them as the world's fastest builders. But the chairman of the building committee took issue with it. He says, no, we're ministers. But we want to get our projects finished quickly so we can get on with our ministry and call on people and help them to understand the Bible. So while we have skills in many fields, and we do building, and we also have skills in perhaps uh, computerization, we have skills when it comes to other things that are required for the organization. Basically, as the Apostle Paul says, we're all ministers. Finding the seed of truth, watering it, and Jehovah makes it grow. So as ministers of Jehovah, Let's continue to build, spiritually and otherwise, for the future. And as we do that, let's make sure that we build into ourselves the kind of qualities that Jehovah will approve, having in mind what you wrote in verse 20 of his letter. But you, beloved ones, by building up yourselves on your most holy faith and praying with Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love while you are waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ with everlasting life in you. Thank you very much, Brother Jarris, uh, for visiting with us and giving our dedication talk. And brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be appropriate for all 5,561 that attended today to send along our love and greetings to both the governing body and uh, the United States Bethel family. Sure, Brother Terry, we'll do that. Well, let's come to the conclusion of our day. Although we can have a little time to fellowship again a little bit after. So feel free to stay as long as you wish. And uh, we have a lot of friends we haven't seen for a while. Nice to see old friends still in the truth and still persevering. We have a fine song to finish with. This is uh, the building, and now we're going to put an emphasis on the goodness of the kingdom a little bit more. And so, song number 150, this good news of the kingdom, let us preach. So let's all stand and sing together this final song for the day, and then Brother Jarvis will close.